Hi everybody, this is Susan Storm from Psychology Junkie, and today I have the special privilege of being joined by Crystal Duan. We are talking about extroverted intuition today, and I'm really excited because Crystal is an ENFP, so she's someone who really lives and breathes in the world of extroverted intuition. If you're new to my channel, then we've been talking about the cognitive functions. We've been going through all eight of them, and this is the seventh of eight that we've been talking about. And I'm going to just give Crystal the mic for a minute so she can tell you a little bit about herself. Okay. Hi. Um, thanks, Susan. And hi, everyone. I'm Crystal. Um, yeah, I'm an ENFP. So I feel like I've led like a life that's very ENFP coded. Like I went to journalism school, so I was a journalist for a few years. And then I became self-employed. So I was basically like doing marketing, brand messaging, like picking up like kind of what the vibes are in society of collective ideas. And I live in New York now. And yeah, I'm actually looking to get back into the content space and make some more content about functions because I've, I've kind of been like on and off doing it for a while. Like I've written for Susan and like I have my YouTube channel. But yeah, I think I want to make my way back. So I'm super excited to be here today. Thank you, Crystal. Yeah, Crystal has written several articles for the Psychology Junkie blog, so you can either look her up on our search engine. Um, I know she wrote a post that was how to help your loved ones de-stress based on their Myers-Briggs personality type. I also think she wrote one that was the Netflix show you'd mm -hmm. like if you based on your type. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. It's been, a, it's been a couple of years, so I can't remember all of them, but she's written some really good content for us. And I'm excited to have the extroverted intuitive here to contribute to this talk about extroverted intuition. I also want to say hi to the people who've tuned in. Hi, Katja, Bridget, no, no one watches, <laughs> and uh, Cutthroat Beast. Thank you for being here. Great to have an ENFJ here, Bridget. Um, even though extroverted intuition isn't at the top of your function stack, I think that ENFJs and ENFPs can get along really well. In fact, Crystal, isn't one of your good friends an ENFJ, Megan Lavoda? Yeah. Um and I have plenty of just ENFJ friends in general, like Megan, I really credit for getting me into the types uh, back when we were both in college together. So yeah, it she has great content too, if you wanna check her out, yeah. Thank you, yeah. So we're, like as usual, we're just gonna hop right into talking about extrovert intuition. That way, if you're new to the cognitive functions, you can get an overview of what this function is. Um, I do want to put a little apology out there. I know my video is really weird lately. It's been really laggy, but next week I'm going to have a new computer. So should all be working better by then. So just bear with me as I'm dealing with this old computer now. Alrighty. So I'm going to pull up my slides on extroverted intuition. All right. If anyone has any issues seeing or hearing, always make sure you let me know in the comments and I will try to fix that up. So extroverted intuition is a perceiving function. So the thinking and feeling functions are our judging functions. Those are what we use to make decisions. Intuition and sensing are our perceiving functions. Those are the ways that we gather information. So perceiving functions help us to gather data, learn about the world, and have awareness about different things. These are the types who value extroverted intuition. So these types have extroverted intuition in their primary function stack, starting with ENTPs, ENFPs, INTPs, INFPs, ESFJs, ESTJs, ISFJs, and ISTJs. Now you might be surprised seeing SJs on the list. You might be thinking, what in the world? How do they have extroverted intuition? Those are sensing types. So each, everyone uses all eight functions. But these um, eight types right here all use extroverted intuition in various levels of strength. So ENFPs and ENTPs are what we would call dominant extroverted intuitives. So for them, it's the function that they really live and breathe without even having to try. They may not even think about it because it just comes so naturally to them. And then INFPs and INTPs, they have extroverted intuition as their auxiliary function. So they're intuition supports their dominant function of either introverted thinking or introverted feeling. And then as you get lower down the list with the SJs, the intuition becomes a little less pronounced and there's a little bit more uncertainty for those types when they're using it, but it's still something that they do value. All right, Katja, also great to have an INFP here and Cutthroat Beast. I'm happy to see you here as an ENTP. We're finally getting to your function. I know you've been tuning in. <laughs> For many weeks now. So it's great that we're finally getting into extrovert intuition for you. So 
Extroverted intuition focuses on imagining, exploring, and innovating. Many extroverted intuitive types would call themselves explorers, innovators, seers, the seekers. They're always on a journey, it seems like, to discover new things. And extroverted intuition builds future possibilities from the information available now. It explores what could be and envisions how situations, objects, and data can be used. So an extroverted intuitive might look at a tree and think, oh, I could do a thousand things with that tree. Like I could build this, this house with that tree, or I could build, I don't know. I'm not an extroverted intuitive. Crystal, what would, it, what would an ENFP think when they're walking through the forest and they see a cool tree? Hmm. I, I feel like it's <laughs> intuition. Well, I, I always talk about it in the context of how it pairs with introverted sensing. Um, and I think of like the genesis of things as like, like the introverted sensing is like this one, like kind of tree. And then there's, there's, a, it's like a tree and then the branches are like an E. So there's many possibilities that kind of derive from like one source. So when I look at a tree, I think of like, oh, it's a thing that grows. And then I start to think about like how a tree can be like a metaphor for like something in my life that's growing or the tree might, I don't know, be dying. I think about like things that die. Um, So it's kind of like, I could think of like um, the fact that it is like used in building houses with with, like wood, but I more so think of the tree as like an idea that, can like give birth to more future possibilities. So it's kind of like NE looks at like this whole intuitive context and each new thing it encounters in the physical world could be like a node in that. Um, So when we think about like situations, objects and data can be used, I really resonate with that because everything can be potential for my creative endeavors. Cause I really resonate with like being someone that goes out and likes seeks novelty, but it's not the same as like you know, like an ESFP seeking novelty. Like I'm not trying to get a physical thrill. I'm trying to get like a lot of inspiration. So yeah, the possibilities are like what this tree can like teach me or show me slash other people about what life is itself. And this could go for like, I don't know, like a cup, like it contains water. Water could be a metaphor, cup could be a metaphor, all this stuff. I love that, Crystal. You explained that really well, especially for the way I put you on the spot there all of a sudden. (laughs) Thank you. Surprising too. <laughs> and that's, I didn't feel as bad. If you were maybe an ISJ, I would have felt bad putting you on the spot like that. But I, every EP I know is so good at just running with something. Like you toss them a ball and they, they can throw it back really quick. Uh, um, <laughs> we have a comment from Cutthroat Beast. He says, turn it into a house carved into the tree or paint the tree a different color, etc." That's a great, you know, great example. I like seeing the examples of extrovert intuition in the comments. Yes, Crystal, I saw your hand go up for a second. I was gonna say, um, I believe Cutthroat Beast is an ENTP. Um, I found that like the difference with ENTPs and ENFPs with how we like to build possibilities because the TI and FI does work differently. I found that a lot of ENTPs are like very good at like crafting and figuring how to like kind of use stuff. Um, so I feel like if I saw a tree, my first instinct wouldn't be to literally do something with it, but I found that every ENTP I know is very creative. Like, for example, if I'm like in the kitchen, I'm like, I have all these ingredients, but I don't know what to make. It's always an ENTP that literally can improvise like anything out of that. And I actually credit like that to their NE plus TI. For me, it's like any and FI. I'm thinking of like how to make something really poetic and like beautiful and like you know, with the NF like sensibility. So I feel like I tend to use the possibility in the context of creating something different. Um, but yeah, like, so I feel like your example kind of can pertain to how an ENTP, like Cutthroat Beast example, would be able to like make something out of it in this more logical way, I guess. So yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a good, it's good to differentiate between the two because introverted thinking, which is what ENTPs use, it's always trying to figure out how things are constructed. A lot of times it applies to ideas or theories, but it can also apply to the physical world. How does this work? So it could look at a tree and think of ways of constructing on that tree and adding to it to make it different. Whereas for an ENFP, like you're saying, with introverted feeling, it's more of what does this tree, what could this tree teach me about myself? Like, yes. what do these branches signify to me about maybe th- ways that I'm growing or stretching in different ways? Yeah. And like an emotional sort of process, 
like the tree can help me with that. Um, it's like it's less like straightforward in a certain sense, in my opinion. Yeah, but it's still a really powerful way of, of harnessing that intuition. Also, hi, DJ. Thanks for joining us again. Um, <coughs> excuse me. All right. So extroverted intuition are, I, I wrote that wrong, <laughs> extroverted intuitives are the ultimate innovators. They look at everything in the context of how it could be transformed, changed, or improved. So extroverted intuition is kind of the the opposite side of the coin of introverted sensing. Introverted sensing, which is what SJs primarily um, perceive the world with, is focused on what how, what things are in the current moment, how they've been used in the past, what lessons we can learn from the past, and basically the tangible world as it is. Extroverted intuition is always trying to change that. So it's not content to just leave things as they are. It's always thinking forward about how can I transform this thing? What's the evolution of this thing? What is the future? What are future possibilities are, it's, you know, triggered in my mind when I look at this or that thing or talk about this or that thing. So that's really what gives um, ENP is they're really innovative spark. A lot of times when you see like entrepreneurs and innovators like Walt Disney, um, Steve, Steve, uh, whatever, Wozniak, like all these amazing innovators, a lot of times you'll find that a lot of these great innovators had extroverted intuition. So inter extroverted intuition is very focused on connecting the dots. It looks at everything in the context of its relationship to everything else. Um, there's a show I really like, probably no one's seen it here, I don't know, but it's called um, Dirk Gently. And I think that he's an ENP character and he's always talking about how everything is connected and it's this really random show. And he's always, these random things in the show are constantly connecting to each other. I think it's a complete extroverted intuitive type of a show. But you find that as you're talking to ENFBs, ENTPs, that they will draw these really unusual connections between things. And you're like, wow, I never would have thought of that. But they saw it because when they see things, they're, they're just constantly like connecting the dots, as you see here. In fact, Dario Nardi, who is a neuroscience expert, and many of you might have heard of him from his book, neuroscience of personality, he talks about how extroverted intuitives have what's called a Christmas tree pattern in their in their brain waves, where there's all these um, different sections of the neocortex that are amplified and out of sync with each other, but that's the process of kind of finding all these random connections. So I'm gonna, again, pass the mic to Crystal. Have you, do you relate to this or can you have like maybe an example from your own life of this connecting the dots. Yeah, so it's interesting because I feel like, once again, I'm gonna bring in SI real quick as a cameo. I feel like it's because I never forget like certain details um, or memories. I very passively can like recall conversations like word for word pretty well. So by that logic, it's pretty easy to connect everything and because you kind of have everything at your disposal at all times. Um, it's funny because like, I ironically have a hard time remembering what stuff I have. So like I have to physically have all my clothes hanging like in front of me to remember like what they are. And I really hate putting things away in drawers. And I feel like kind of like my inner world is kind of reflective of this too, because like a lot of like things are just all there at once. Like every single person I've like ever really cared about is someone that can like pass through my mind rather quickly. I can like recall the lyrics to like a song I haven't heard in like, 10 years that I really loved for like a long time. Um, so yeah, I feel like it's kind of like the whole point of like connecting everything is you're trying to like make a sort of like map of like your own version of ex experiencing meaning. And you have like all these like different pieces. I've, I was explaining like the difference between like NE and like NI to my friend the other day. And I was saying how like, I feel like for me, like, images come very clearly but it's like I'm putting together a puzzle of like what things are so like depending on like the details of it it can also like make or break like my perception so in a sense I don't think I experience time also linearly I feel like I literally can like accidentally get swept back up into like a nostalgic moment from like like if I hear a song from like you know like five years ago I will suddenly feel like I was that person like five years ago and whatnot and yeah, intuition, like expert intuition really is like, we also talk like we have ADHD, even if we literally like don't necessarily do, like I've been mistaken for having ADHD, even though I have no problem focusing on things because we 
can like, as we're talking, it's like this connection can like just swoop in because everything's always interconnected from like us somatically processing and like kind of holding details close to our chest. And I found people without this axis don't remember the certain details as well. They kind of more are selective, like NI is more filtering for what it cares about. But it's like, I remember everything almost against my will personally. I found like more uh, like NE users are better at this too than like the other types. So I think the memory really comes in handy with like what to connect. Thank you. Yeah, I love how you um, combined explaining introverted sensing and how it relates to that. So one thing that I think is really interesting, and I think it's probably on a, a future slide, but is that extroverted intuitives are kind of syncing information from past, present, and future into this web of information and connections. And one thing you'll find with other types, like SJ types are very focused on present past, you know, what's happened in the past and what can that teach me about now? Mm -hmm. And and J types are very focused on like the future present. So like what's happening now and what does that tell me about the future? But when you run into with um, NPs is they're kind of all over the place as far as like time is concerned. And you said something about kind of every <laughs> everywhere, everything all at once, kind of like that movie had yeah. everywhere, everything all at once, which I think every NP I know absolutely loves which I as an NJ found that movie totally exhausting, but <laughs> NPs kind of, they, they are, they have all this stuff going on in their brain all, all the time. Their brain is, mm -hmm. has like a million different details and possibilities and connections going on. And it spans these, this time from past, present to future. Yeah. And so it's a really interesting thing. And I got a comment here. Um, Throat B says, almost like those story games like Detroit Become Human or The Walking Dead that every choice leads to another choice and outcome. It's like a spider web. That's a great example. I've never played those games, but my daughter, my teenage daughter does, so I'll have to tell her about that. <laughs> yeah, I also wanted to add that I feel like I tend to index more heavily on the past because it's more like readily available because I can kind of transfer myself back at any time. Um, and I don't know about other ENPs, but I tend to be really anxious about the future. Um, and like, I guess like after I learned functions, I started like noticing that it was because I kind of assumed that the future will be exactly like the past in some way. Uh, I kind of like, like clean really tightly. And I've noticed that like a lot of NI users tend to be more like bullish on like, I'm going to like make my vision come true. I'm going to like make this happen in this way. And I feel like I'm like, well, I, could, I guess I could try to make it happen, but like, you never know. Cause like in the past, I didn't know that this was going to happen. And like, I have no control. Uh, I don't know how ENTPs might interface with this, but certainly for the NFPs, like this is like a huge failure mode for us that we'll be so convinced that something bad's going to happen. Cause also when you index heavily on the past, sometimes you accidentally can focus too much on the negative things that you don't want as an NFP. So that has been something I've really worked on over the years uh, to like be very conscious of my ability to like harness my own agency. Because when you're weighed down by remembering so much of the past, then sometimes it's better to be able to forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's something I've noticed too, especially with INFPs sometimes is this a replaying of past failures or past mistakes or embarrassing past moments. And kind of when, especially when they there's like a um, movement into grip sensing like if you have um inferior introverted sensing i've noticed that there's a lot of like overwhelming uh repetitions in the mind of things that went badly in the past and this mm -hmm. idea that it's just going to keep going badly in the future very much so i feel like like there's definitely like ne loops which we'll, i'm sure we'll talk about later and there's like si ones and if you're too heavy on one or the other it's like very disorienting for sure like you'll be like like for me i tend to get stuck in there's so many possibilities of how things could go but the only ones i'm like feeling connected or intimate with are like the bad ones this is horrible mm. get out yeah. yeah yeah that's so interesting thank you for sharing that yeah that because that is something that i've also noticed with enps when they're in a grip is yeah all these bad possibilities are going to come come around or um i've also noticed like with some ENPs I know is like a hyper awareness of their inner body because uh, introverted sensing also gives you kind of a hyper awareness of, uh, of your inner body at times. And so I know sometimes with ENPs, there's like a feeling of, oh no, I've got a headache. It must be a hemorrhage in my brain or something like that. You're paranoid. Um, the last thing you remember reading about sometime or whatever. 
I think DJ had a comment just now. I just want to quickly address. Uh, DJ said, so were you saying that SI allows you to store information, experiences, et cetera, for your any to use when it wants? Yeah, very much so. Um, I do believe that, you know, we can like repress memories too very selectively, but because we, for the most part, tend to remember a lot of stuff, we sometimes won't notice if we're like selectively remembering. This is something I actually realized I do recently uh, to reinforce some pessimistic Brain patterns of mine. But for the most part, I'd say in the neutral sense of it, yeah, like SI just kind of lets you soak in everything and such. Um, I feel like NI, just from my guess, from what I've heard people say is very like, you can like be more like focused, like tunnel vision on things. I'm kind of like floating around, like looking at everything and having it just like absorb. Thank you. Yeah. And if anyone's tuning in here and they're not sure, like, you know, because I know a lot of us know what these like these cognitive function terms mean. But if you're not sure what SI means, uh, we're talking about introverted sensing, which is the other perceiving function that NPs have. And that's the one we talked about last week. So if you want to find out more about SI too, introverted sensing, you can always go to my YouTube page and find that live stream from last week when we talked about introverted sensing as well. I think that was last week. Yes, that was last week. <laughs> and um, yeah, if you have any questions about what anything that we're saying, if you're like not sure exactly what we mean, feel free to ask us so we can clarify. All righty. Um, so here's a real life example of extrovert intuition. A reader sent this in to me. She said, my husband brought me a list of vacation options for our anniversary trip. I started talking about the pros of going to one of the locations and he assumed that meant I had picked that location. He booked the trip there and what surprised when I started listing off all the pros of all the other locations. Every option gave me dozens of amazing possibilities in my mind, and I just didn't want to narrow them down. <laughs> so a lot of times yes. with extroverted intuitives, they, they, they start talking about a possibility. And if they're with a judging type, the judging type might be like, oh, that's what they want to do. Is that that thing they're talking about now. Mm -hmm. So I will go ahead and make a plan based on that thing. And then the ENP is thinking, wait, no, I was just having fun talking about that possibility. There's still a dozen more we didn't even talk about yet. And so it can cause sometimes confusion between ENPs and then their judging friends and partners or whatever, because the partner's like, wait, you said you really liked the idea of Brazil. So I was thinking I bought plane tickets for Brazil and now you're talking about France or whatever it is. You know, there's this ENPs love playing in the world of possibilities and talking about it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they've chosen one. That totally resonates. Like literally, this is how I am when I want to go somewhere on vacation. Like I had the hardest time planning my Europe trip earlier this year because I was like, well, they all sound pretty great. Um, <laughs> and same with like, honestly, sometimes like hanging out with like friends in New York, like if I have an option of going like three parties at a like in a day, I'll be like, well, they all, well, here's the pros of all of them. Maybe I'll try to hit all of them. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very tiring to, you know, someone like me who's an INTJ, because you want know, the difference between NI or NJ types versus NP types is NJ types are always trying to narrow down their options. Like, what's the one thing? Whereas NP types are always trying to multiply their options. <laughs> what more could we do? And so sometimes when you get NJs and NPs together, they kind of can have friction or get on each at each other's throats sometimes because the NJ is like, what are we actually doing? And the NP is like, well, let's just it's 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 almost a little depressing for them to be cutting out options. Now they can get along really well, so I'm not at all saying they're incompatible. I'm just saying that at times the two functions can clash when people are trying to make a decision, especially. Yeah, I am guilty of being the person that will not only not pick, but also start talking a lot about like whatever and get off track. Uh, I had to really learn to just go off gut instinct and not like think like, well, maybe I should have like, that's like definitely something that I think I could have been more guilty of if I hadn't trained that out of me. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's something that like I appreciate about NPs because what, like what you were saying, they have a good memory for details sometimes. And so it's when they're talking, they can explain things in a very inspiring way. Um, but at times it's like when you're they they can bounce from thing to thing and when they're with each other it's so inspiring it's like wow we are building each other up with all these possibilities and then if you throw a you know a, a judger in the mix they're like wait i thought we were talking about global warming and now we're talking about 
Sesame Street? What? How did we get from here to there? Um, and then there's a question, a comment here from INFP Anthology. They say, I feel like extrovert intuition has a way with words, especially lyrics, and this links back to introverted sensing. And I've also noticed this um, whenever I've had NJ or NPs or SJs write for my blog. I've noticed that their writing is, they bring in all these random and funny connections and there's a lot of personality in it. And it's so interesting. And I, I always prepare myself to get depressed after I read a guest post from an NP or an SJ type, because I always read it and go, I could never write like that. I'm a total failure because I do, but I just do think that they have a really strong way with words. I agree with you. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Crystal, about why <laughs> why would why would NPs or SJs have this? What is NE doing that gives it that way with words? I well, I mean, I am a writer. I have a Substack, um, and I have a lot of INFJ friends that tell me that they like really envy the way I am with words, um, and are really impressed by how I also write. Um, which I don't think is necessarily like an anything. I think it's a me thing, but I think it's like. I'll, I'll like have this like nebulous idea, like maybe an FI feeling. And then it's almost like the right word comes to me and it comes from like a distant time. Like maybe the time I first saw that word, like it's like, like an SAT word or something. Like I used to kind of like read reading the dictionary for fun when I was a kid. It was just fun to look at all the different words and I didn't even think I was retaining many of them. Um, I actually like have stopped reading as much, but I think because I read so much as a kid, like I permanently have this like bank and such. I just think that we we spend so much time unconsciously trying to figure out how to convey an idea to ourselves because we really need this like inner dialogue and like feedback loop to like fully contain all the energy I think we're experiencing constantly because we're so sensitive to all of it. That's why we can remember everything because it's like hits me somatically so hard. My, my body's also very sensitive. Like I always know the minute I'm full. I always know like how, like I'm very in tune with like how I can physically handle things or not. I think this comes down to like also being able to like translate feelings and ideas more easily. I just think I'm very like connected to that world. And I think with lyrics, we're trying to tap into like like, I, th I think anytime I, I like the way someone says something, I just subconsciously remember it and index it. And it's kind of like maybe just like my main, like psychosomatic priority to be able to like explain this to myself or other people constantly. So it's like, you know, just like an un 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 unconscious like desire you have. So I feel like the reason we have this way with words just comes down to like, that's all that we like live and breathe for. Like the whole reason why for me at least, I want to like experience all these possibilities and like give other people that experience too is because I'm always fascinated by how vast the world is and how much I want to be like both a, a driving force in it but also have it impact me a lot too. So like when I write, it's just like another way to like celebrate that in a sense. And I think this, well, I, this is like a very NFP way of thinking. I'm not really sure how like an NTP would say it, but I just think we just always capture like these feelings to ourselves, even when we're not literally writing. And I like to tell people that like, I'm writing when I'm not like typing or have a pen in my hand. I'm still writing because I'm still like experiencing it and figuring out how to relate to what I just experienced. Thank you. That was a great example. It's always great to, I'm glad we could have you here to explain it. And it's not just, you know, me theorizing about what extrovert intuition is. Um, yeah, so, so here, so extra, oops, there's a problem on this slide I made too, but extrovert intuition does have a type of intelligence to it. So extroverted intuition is ingenious at coming up with possible solutions and spotting a window of opportunity where everyone else sees closed doors. So a lot of times NPs really shine in situations where other types are kind of freaking out. Um, this is actually a perceiver trait in general. One thing you'll find with EPs especially is when everyone's panicking and it seems like there's no solution, they're really good at kind of improvising and rigging something up, some kind of finding some possibility out of nowhere. Um, and that's one thing that ENPs are really, really good at. They're also good at filling in the blanks by connecting all the known information into a plausible explanation for something. 
um, when everyone's stumped about why did this thing happen, they can, because they're accessing all this data from past, present, and future, they can kind of tie it all together into, uh, well, this could be why, or this could be why, or that could be why. <laughs> they can usually find, you know, 101 explanations for why something is happening. And um, before we get into common features of extroverted intuition, let's show this comment from Steven, because maybe we can answer that question. What's the best way I, for INFPs to tap into this supporting function and maximize this strength? So whenever you're an introverted type, there's going to be a temptation to stay in an introverted space. And so for INFPs, there might be a temptation to kind of loop back and forth between introverted feeling and introverted sensing, which is very comfortable with routines, with, you know, examining emotions and getting into these routines. Like maybe it's staying home and, you know, watching the same movie over and over again or reading the same series of books over and over again, or not really like trying new things. So when you're trying to incorporate extroverted intuition, you want to experience new possibilities, new situations. These kinds of things will spark your intuition and give you this, that inspiration you need to explore new possibilities. And Crystal, I know you have some thoughts on this too. I always do. <laughs> okay. This is actually funny because I, before we brought up Steven's comment, I wanted to comment on the previous slide, but I actually feel like my comment on the previous slide would actually apply to answering this question. Uh, do you actually mind going back real quick to... Is it this one right here? The... Um... Oh, no, I mean like uh, uh, the slide. Of... Oh, the slide. Okay. Oh, sorry. sorry, I got mixed up here. Okay. okay. This one, yeah. And if you can click on Steven's comment again, just to bring it... Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I want to add some nuance to extroverted intuition. Uh, it's very good at filling in the blanks and connecting all the known information when it's feeling neutral. Um, because if you have extroverted intuition and you're like an NP type, you will automatically pair it with your introverted judging, which is FI or TI if you're an NFP or NTP. Uh, and I think that like a failure mode potentially, not saying that you're in this failure mode, Stephen, because I don't know you, but something I've seen with like the INPs who really struggle with tapping into NE is I actually think that if your SI is very intent on staying comfortable and guarded, which isn't a bad thing. Sometimes it's very necessary and we at ENP should learn from this. If you're very like committed to this guardedness, you're not going to want to engage the NE. This can like be like, you know, looping of all sorts or various levels of like not optimo, optimal health or kind of like lack of like practice. But I was going to say, like, I feel like NE is very good at, like, connecting everything and seeing the possibilities when it's feeling naturally open and balanced with the SI. When it's not feeling that way, it'll be like, I only see one possibility and it is bad. Like, when I'm like, so, like, I have a lot of trouble with, like, romantic relationships, to be honest, because I've had a lot of bad experiences. And, of course, I remember, like, mostly the bad ones over the really good ones. So I won't be wanting to be in this everything's possible state at that time because my SI will be so like kind of like blocking my ability to use any even as an NE DOM. So what I would say is the best way for like INFPs, maybe also INTPs to tap into NE is you kind of have to examine like what holds you back? What are you really afraid of when it comes to like an, an extroverted activity? Like it could be like, I'm afraid of going to more parties because I don't want to embarrass myself and like go through the pain of like feeling socially awkward or like, I don't want to like put myself out there in like a different way like it doesn't have to always be like people oriented but it can just be like in getting out of your comfort zone and usually it's because you're indexing very heavily on feeling guarded in some way or not having like a very strong self-concept of like yeah i can totally do that like you know like not, like not having access to this unfettered confidence for me i used to be actually really shy even though i've always been an extrovert because I would just see over and over that people would just respond really poorly to me because they would think I talk too much or that like I'm annoying. And I really internalized that to where I never wanted to try. So um, I don't know. I don't think INFPs would have quite the same struggle, but I relate to like my SI will hold me back from things if I've gone through pain as an NFP. But the best way to tap into that is I actually think like reading like 
<laughs> reading self-help books and like it consuming empowering content. I hate to say it, it's kind of cheesy, but I think it does actually help because it breaks you out of like whatever moral judgments you've already made about how the world works and how you work. Because sometimes and INFPs and ENFPs, INFPs can be like really committed to how they think things are going to go, even if it's unconscious. So the best way to actually tap into this NE is to be really honest with your SI and be super self-compassionate about how scary it is to go out and try, but to not feel like that's the expectation. It has to be that way. Like a lot of it comes down to like the more balanced and the more patient you are with yourself, the more you'll like kind of want to use that any like you're kind of like a cat basically in this sense oh thank you crystal i think that's a, a, it's great to have a feeler on here because my <laughs> answers as a as uh having intj preferences are sometimes very like well here's what you need to do bullet point bullet point bullet point and um i can always see like when i have a feeler on here they're able to bring much more of the emotional component into it and um i think kata actually had a good good answer too about like as an INFP, I was going on the floor since there were so much new things which helped me to get new and new ideas usually from my books. Yeah, like you don't even have to necessarily like go do something you don't want to do to engage the NE. Some of it is, yeah, just making sure you're filling your life with a certain amount of novelty will help you feel excited about it again and not just stuck in SI sometimes. Yeah, it could be even something like, I'm going to watch a new movie I never would have thought of watching. Like, it doesn't, you know, like it can be going out and interacting with new people, but it could be, I'm going to read this book from a genre I've never read before. Uh, basically, anything that's going to introduce you to new material that you can then, your intuition can play with. Yeah, um, like your comfort zone, once you know what it is, then you'd be like, all right, we're going to do this. Like, I'm like engaging in new hobbies this month, and I was really reluctant to, and then I was really honest myself about why I don't want to engage that, why my NE isn't excited about that, is because I was so convinced I was going to be bad at it because I mm. had tried something like that before as a kid. So I feel like it's always SI that's stopping you from engaging the NE. Otherwise, it is very natural to do that as an NP. Yeah, it's that point where you just have to be like, you know what, whatever happens, happens, but I'm just going to put my foot out there and try. You know, if I don't ever try, I won't ever know. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, so let's move into common features of extroverted intuition. It might seem a little repetitive because we've talked about some of these things already, but the focus is on the external world. So any extroverted function is primarily interactive and inspired by the external world. It connects past, present, and future. It loves to brainstorm, evaluate potential, explore, and create options. Um, other features include it seeks variety and novelty. We were just talking about that. Um, creates and spots patterns, connects information from various places to create a hypothesis, and values inspiration above all else. Now, I, I, people say extroverted intuition values inspiration above all else. I'm sure that ENPs probably value their relationships or their friends or family or above inspiration necessarily, but there is this high desire to be inspired, and that's where all that new and novel experiences and information comes in. They love that feeling of, oh, I never thought about it that way before. And, oh, I never, now I have this possibility in my brain that I never thought of before. The idea of being, um, seeing some possibility, some sparkling possibility out there that they can try to imagine reaching is so exciting for them. Sometimes the struggle is follow through because you might be thinking, oh, I really want to be, I don't know, um, take these, uh, I, I want to write a book or something. I have this great idea for a book. So you start writing the book, but then once you get into the nitty gritty details of writing the book, maybe another thing comes to your mind. Like I should learn to play the guitar. And then you start taking lessons, but then the lessons start. As you're taking a, a guitar lesson, you suddenly think about, well, maybe I should, um, you know, set up a party for my friends. Like there's the, the struggle I think with extroverted intuition and Carl Jung talks about this in psychological types is that well, by the time they've started on one possibility, their brain has already kind of given them a dozen other ones that they simultaneously want to pursue. And um, that that seeking of inspiration and that chasing after inspiration is wonderful, but it can sometimes mean that ENP struggle with, you know, finishing what they start. And uh, <laughs> the healthy extroverted intuition 
is able to come up with all these ideas and have some amount of follow through because they're integrating their judging function. So if you're an ENFP, you're integrating introverted feeling and you're you're sorting out your value is, values and you're prioritizing what's important to you. And that that alignment with introverted feeling helps you to stay the course even when things get a little bit dull sometimes. Or if you're an ENTP, you're integrating introverted thinking. And it's not really logical to, you know, start one project and move off to 10 different other projects and leave them all unfinished. So when you're aligning introverted thinking into your process, then you're thinking through like what logically makes the most sense to prioritize. And then you're able to, again, stick with things that make sense, even when they get a little bit dull sometimes or a little bit difficult. Um, Crystal, any thoughts on that? I have a lot of things to say. <laughs> it's actually like really funny because in a meta sense, I don't even know which one to start with. <laughs> Get it? Because I'm like chasing which idea do I want to talk about first? All right. So I'm going to just go off of like the slideshow real quick with the values inspiration above all else. Uh, so I feel like I actually do care about being inspired above all else. Like, and, and the thing is, all my close relationships inspire me in some way, even like, quote, censors or SJs or like just I have worked to be the kind of person that can find a lot of things inspiring that like prove some of my trauma wrong about the world. And a lot of like the people I care about, they don't have to be like, you know, intuitives that can like talk as fast as me. But if they care about that stuff, quite simply, I will value them for that. Like. I, as an any user, I can, I like, I guess, carry the weight of like being able to see the inspiration in all things already, but the people that make that really easy for me, cause like maybe they've seen me through like certain life stages or they care about the same things as me cause we arrived at the same conclusions, even from like different life experiences. I will say that like the relationships in my life that I tend to like move on from, which sounds kind of cold, are the people that just don't prioritize that. Because I think everyone can kind of value inspiration in some way, um, right? Because you kind of need like a healthy amount to like not get like dragged up down by the monotony of like everyday life. So I just wanted to point that out. Like I do think that if like an ENP is struggling in their relationships, they need like a steady source of like good inspiration that makes them feel grounded for them to be able to figure out who really matters to them. Um, so that's like one thing. And then, yeah, with finishing what you started, um, I feel like it really comes down to like really developing, yeah, that introverted judging, like you said. And I think it also just comes down to like being very humble about and seeing what the joy and the inspiration is in actually finishing and committing. So one of my favorite authors is Mark Manson. And he was talking about how there's a lot of freedom in commitment. Like, you know, like, and there's also this meme, like, tweet that I love, which is like, I fear not the man who's closed 10,000 tabs. I fear the man who's closed one tab 10,000 times. And it's like so funny to me because like, I do think that like, when you really stick to something and choose to get really good at it and like really love and enjoy that without thinking about all the other options, there is a sort of like very grounded inspiration that you get from just simply deciding to not think about the other possibilities. You can actually train your brain to like not focus on those um, as much because um, I don't know about INPs, but for me, like I always feel like, <laughs> like actually it's like funny because with dating, I ha would have this pattern of like dating several people at once just to like, uh, like if I was being honest with myself, it was because I was really running away from being able to really own and take responsibility for what I want because I felt very like unworthy of it to some degree. And I felt very like scared of the idea of like trying to do something with one person and failing badly. So let me just have all these other options or whatever. And I feel like something with like hobbies and projects is this way too, where I don't want to go one at a time because I'm so afraid of like being bad at like one of them. Um, and like, I think every time that you get stuck in not finishing something, you have to really look within, sit down with yourself, slow down your nervous system, meditate and take some deep breaths and be like, what am I, how am I using these projects as escapism? I, I think that naturally and is always going to be a little scattered, but we don't have to be scattered to the point where it's like actually like a problem in our lives because 
with all this extra energy to burn off because we're so inspired by like everything around us, we're going to naturally want to like spread it around. But I think like you don't have to be promiscuous with spreading your energy. You can be very uh, intentional and you can ask yourself, what do I actually care about? And if you don't know, you can be like, okay, I'm going to set some boundaries and give myself like this much time to try this thing. And if that doesn't work within this amount of time, I will just switch to another thing. So if you just tell yourself to go at it one at a time, even if you're still switching between projects, it won't look as scattered and you will like feel better about like not following through. Cause it's also about like finding the thing you like. And this is very much like my pattern with like making good friends too. Like some of my closest friends that I've had for like several years, but for a long time, I honestly wasn't the kind of person that would be able to keep friends very well either. Um, and I think it does come down to when you're always seeking novelty and possibility. It's also because subconsciously you're very afraid of going very deep into one possibility. Uh, but the development of an ENP is to be able to own that. Thank you, Crystal. That was really, really helpful. Um, I, I really appreciate that because that's something that I think a lot of, I've gotten a lot of emails over the years from ENPs who are like, how can I help? help what, what can I do about procrastination? Or not procrastination as much as distractibility and things like that. And what you're saying about, you know, getting in touch with yourself, I think that's so important. I think that's important for, you know, that again, that's getting into your introverted functions, introverted mm -hmm. thinking, introverted feeling, introverted sensing. It's getting into those. And the introverted judging functions are all about prioritizing it to, to a degree, like prioritizing what you want, what's really important to you as an as a feeling perceiver or prioritizing what makes what's logically consistent for you if you're a thinking perceiver. So anytime you start feeling like you're going off the rails with too many, too, you're too scattered and you can't find focus, that's always a sign that you need to kind of slow down and, as Crystal said, maybe take some breaths, do some meditation and get in touch with yourself and, and figure out what do I actually want right now? What's actually, what do I actually need to prioritize? Yeah, um, this is where also having good friends to keep you accountable really helps because I can safely say I would, I would not be able to do this on my own. Um, my three best friends are ENFJ and INTJ and INFJ, and they like lovingly hold me accountable to asking myself all the time and checking in with myself about like, what am I actually feeling? What do I actually want? What I actually desire? Because I think a lot of times with my I think like when you're an NP, like SI, you can, tr you can accidentally train your SI into like just running away when you get like scared or when you feel like triggered or when you feel insecure. And you can like mask to the rest of the world that everything's fine and you're just an outgoing person that likes lots of things. But these uh, friends of mine really encouraged me to slow down. And so they'll be able to like kind of see if I'm in an ungrounded place faster than I can, which is why I'm like having really good support system and being very humble about need, what you need help with is very important for an NP. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's great advice, too. And I noticed also um, some comments going on here. I just wanted to acknowledge them. Um, Steven said that uh, they're they're an INFP, but their daughter is an INFP also and is sometimes blocked by her introverted sensing um, and talked about showing the video. And then Katja commented and said, um, I don't know about your daughter since I had difficulties in my past. I was stuck in my introverted sensing, but my parents introduced me to a lot of hobbies. And as I began to be serious in piano, it opened the world. And Katja is giving this really great advice in the comments about, you know, giving your, you know, giving yourself creative possibilities, traveling, going to different, like different cafe or things like that. Trying these new things can be a great way to open up the extrovert intuition for maybe someone who's stuck in their introverted sensing space. Um, I'm going to move forward a little bit because I know I have to be done here at five, my time. And so I'm just going to move forward with the next slide. So I always try to give some quotes about uh, the different functions from other people in the typology world. So I always start with Isabel Briggs Myers. She said, this is her quote about extroverted intuition. She said, extroverted intuitives are hard to describe because of their infinite variety their interest, enthusiasm, and energy pour suddenly into unforeseeable channels like a flash flood, sweeping everything along, overwhelming all obstacles, carving out a path with other, which others will follow long after the force that made it has flowed onto, into other things. So she talks about 
ENE or extrovert intuition is this flood. It's like there's so many, so much energy and enthusiasm poured into this possibility that they've discovered. And then they get everyone else on board and maybe they stay with it, but maybe they've discovered another interesting thing to pursue at that point. Linda Behrens, who is a psychologist and has written a lot about type, says extroverted intuiting involves noticing hidden meanings and interpreting them often entertaining a wealth of possible interpretations from just one idea or interpreting what someone's behavior really means. It also involves seeing things as if with various possible representations of reality. And I love that example of extrovert intuition. Carl Jung, the father of really typology, it says of extrovert intuition, when it is the dominant function, every ordinary situation in life seems like a locked door which intuition has to open. It is constantly seeking fresh outlets and new possibilities in external life. In a very short time, every existi existing situation becomes a prison for the intuitive, a chain that has to be broken. And I really like this particular quote about extrovert intuition because it helps me to, to have a lot more empathy for it. I have a daughter who's an extroverted intuitive. I'm pretty sure she is. She's six years old. So, you know, it could, I, she could change as she gets older, but I very much find that this quote relates to that. It's when they're in a situation, it, it feels like a locked, they're in a room and everything's locked and they've got to figure out way, a way out of it. Like, what can I change? What can I transform? What can I make different? And um, so there's this kind of restlessness with things being the same. Mm -hmm. There's a desire to always change things. And, in it, and I was talking last week in our introverted sensing stream about the difference between my NP child and my SJ child when we go on vacation, for example. When we go on vacation and everything's different, all the routines have changed, my NP child is more obedient than she's ever been any other time because she's satisfied. There's things that are different to play with. There's new ideas and new experiences and everything's novel and exciting. And so she's satisfied. There's no need to test boundaries. Whereas my SJ child on vacation, everything, everything of that he craves about routine and order and stability is thrown off. And so he becomes more naughty on vacation because he's trying to rebel against how different everything is. And so um, this is something I think is interesting about NPs, especially NP children, is they actually sometimes um, function better in a certain amount of unpredictability and chaos, Absolutely. whereas an SJ child they might be more rebellious and, and um, they might seem more, uh, what's the word, difficult in situations like that. I have an ENFP friend who's got an ISTJ child and for the longest time she was like, what's, what's wrong with my child? <laughs> they're so grumpy and they're so, you know, they're, they just always have a bad attitude. And, and it was because both parents were extroverted perceivers and the ISTJ child was thinking, what in the world is my life? Because it's different every day. And so, you know, for an NP, they need they're, they're, they need to be able to play with these possibilities and test the boundaries and, and see and, and make things different and transform them. And if they can't, they can feel like, oh, my life is a prison. I feel trapped. They feel stifled. Everything feels monotonous and their intuition doesn't have a chance to breathe. And that can be really, really hard for them. Any thoughts on, I know I, we just went through a bunch of information and, and slides here. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, Crystal? No, I like super relate to um, this. And well, to go off of what you said first about the, you need an optimal amount of chaos for the NE user to feel calm. I, especially as I've gotten older, because I'm 28, like I've done this to be true. Um, I definitely am not one of those people that romanticizes their childhood because I feel like every year of my life has become more and more fun and like where I want it to be. Um, that's very because like when you grow up and become an adult, like you can design your life the way you want it. And I've always chosen to live in major cities because I need like an amount of chaos, which can come from knowing lots of people and having lots of people around you. Um, it's been very grounding. Like I like enjoy like going outside of New York and just like, I don't get affected by the noise or all the things or distractions personally. I actually feel like I have felt more trapped and depressed when I used to live in the suburbs as a teenager. And if I was living a suburban life now, I don't think I'd be happy. I'd be very bored. So I like how New York, even my alone time is just spent without having 
friends with me. I just walk around by myself many blocks down Manhattan and go, yeah, this is cool, <laughs> you know? So I've been told this is very interesting that like I'm at my happiest when I can be outside with all that stuff going on. And my priority is to just literally be in it, like not do anything with it. Just watch people as they go by, some somebody for hours, things like that. So that's pretty true. And I found that like I've met some SJ friends or previous friends in New York and they say that like when they first moved there, they were so overstimulated that they started like binge drinking and like going on these like crazy like adventures and like feeling horrible, but just they were addicted to that. And for me, I've never really had like trouble with substances or anything like that. Um, if anything, I think my problem is like I will make too many friends to where I can't really like spend quality time with like all of them. And I'll be like, oh, no, I'm stressed about this. What a first world problem. But I definitely saw the like difference in reaction of like how an SJ in New York, my age has dealt with like their environment changing. Uh, so that kind of resonates with, that's like the 20 plus year older version of like your two, your SJ and MP child. So that very much seems true. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think that's, it's really interesting. Like for someone like me, I, I would hate to live in a big city like that where because it would just be so overstimulating. So I have I have a lot of respect for people who, who are inspired by that because I just look at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, how is that even possible? I mean, I love, it. it's, it's good for like small doses. Um, yeah. And then I noticed DJ has a question. He says, maybe this is more of an NFT issue, but what helps to see people realistically rather than their potential or romanticizing them? Oh. I'm going to hand this one over to you, Crystal, since you're an NFT. Maybe oh my speak gosh. That more accurately. <laughs> This makes me really want to get back into making videos. Gosh, <laughs> I forgot how fun it is, honestly, um, giving advice. But yeah, like I would say not every NFP romanticizes people, but they will romanticize what goes on. And I actually think of romanticization of like not just seeing things as better than what they are, but also seeing things as worse than what they are. So like literally like being so sure that you know what something is, is I think romanticization. And I think what is grounding is actually to be aware that you have a cap that you have like a susceptibility to seeing things like unrealistically sometimes. And I think the biggest way out of my own failure mode was just having close friends that like I would tell them when I was like in a good mood, like, hey, just so you know, when I'm in a bad mood, I want you to gently remind me of this so I can then like take care of myself or whatever. Um, but as for like seeing people specifically realistically, I think like my INFJ friend gave good advice because I tend to like, become very infatuated with guys I have crushes on. And she would say like, hey, like you should look at them. And even if you like them overall, you should like think about like, what do I not like about them? What gives me the ick about them? What are their flaws? And she said like actually focusing on those flaws for you won't make you like stop liking them as much but it'll remind you that they're a real person that doesn't have like all this power over you and that was actually really helpful um because like i kind of forget that people also have their insecurities around me i tend to actually make them into like these avatars of like archetypes of things i felt powerless in like situations uh and i think that my tendency to romanticize is because i'm trying to take the shortcut of like seeing what the truth is and unpacking all of it is actually very pertinent to this quote um, that's on the screen right now. The like, every ordinary situation in life is like a locked door and be can become a prison. I think that when we romanticize as NFPs, we are imprisoning ourselves because it feels safer. Because I think when you're like kind of getting whiplash from all the novelty, because we too are human, then your SI will just kind of rebel and tell you that this is how reality is. So you get stuck in seeing people as a static archetype of what you want them to be for better or for worse. So the best way is to, I don't know, see the possibilities in them, the negative possibilities if you're over idealizing them or the positive possibilities if you're idealizing that, oh, if I tell someone how I feel, it's definitely gonna go bad. Like how about let's like go the other way by being like, oh, but what if it like didn't go bad? What, why am I so concerned or why am I so sure that it is going to go bad? And so it's really about, I think, catching yourself in that moment and choosing to not lock yourself in it.
Yeah, and I think even some incorporating of, you know, extroverted sensing. I know that ENPs, you know, extroverted sensing isn't their favorite function, but I mean, mm -hmm. extroverted sensing is that function that tells you these are what the facts are, the observable facts. And um, there's this there's this way of thinking when you when you you learn about it when you get MBTI certified, and it's starting with it's 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 a process that helps you to see situations a little bit more um, thoroughly. And it means starting with, you start with sensing. Like, so you're, say you have, you're idealizing someone. Um, oh, this person's so incredible and they're perfect and they can do no wrong. You start with sensing. Well, what are the facts that, that I know? What has my experiences with this person taught me? And you could even write them down. And then you move to intuition. Well, what are the possibilities with this person? What, what um, implications and, and possibilities do I sense when I'm with this person? And then you move to thinking, well, what's logical in this situation? And what, you know, what am I, what, where's my sense of like, what are the pros and cons of, of being with this person? Or what are the, um, you know, if I was critiquing this relationship, what, what things would I point out? And then you can move to feeling and be like, well, what are my what are my emotions? What's what's their role in this? And what do I personally feel is important about the situation? And when we tie in and make sure that we're we're giving sensing, intuition, thinking, and feeling a, a voice in our perceptions of things, then it can help us to to balance things out. So if you're, you know, maybe if you have a habit of romanticizing someone, bringing a little bit of extroverted sensing into your your mindset, like what are the actual facts? Maybe write them down, the facts you actually know about this person. And, you know, that will be good and negative or neutral things, but it can help you to, to stay a little bit more grounded in, in having this realistic assessment of who the person is. But don't just completely, you know, cut, cut, you know, contain it to facts, like let your intuition play. That's kind of the fun of relationships, too. But um, I do think that SE, extroverted sensing, is a great way of, like, staying grounded in any situation um, because it can just remind you of what, what are the facts we absolutely know right now. Um, now, I just want to get, I'll just move on through the rest of the, just uh, compare and contrast real quick because some people don't know. They're like, am I an INFP or am I an INFJ? Am I a... NJ or an NP, it can be kind of difficult because on the surface, sometimes it can look a little similar. So these are some differences between extroverted intuition versus introverted intuition. Introverted intuition is what NJs use. So extroverted intuition focuses on the external world. So it's getting its inspiration through the external world. And when it's being inspired and, and exploring these possibilities, it tends to um, extrapolate them verbally in some way too. So when you're with an NP and they're getting ideas, a lot of times they'll talk about it and it'll become clearer. The idea will become clearer the more they talk about it. And whereas with NJs, their focus is on the internal world. And so they are actually do better, you know, thinking about all these possibilities and ideas quietly in a very low stimulus, stimulus environment where because it's more of an internal process. It's not as much of an external process as it is for intuitive perceivers. Extroverted intuition also creates lots of possibilities. It's always trying to multiply possibilities, whereas introverted intuition wants to narrow down possibilities to find the one thing, like the one idea that will work. So one thing you will find with NPs is they don't really like it when you try to narrow them down to one plan, one rule, or one decision. They want to keep adding more to the plate, whereas NJs feel better as they get closer to finding a decision. Um, extrovert intuition has a broad focus, so it's easily bounces from one idea to the next. One minute it could be talking about, like, you know, climate change, and then it's talking about religion, and then it's talking about, um, you know, favorite childhood TV shows and all these different things. It's very broad and can come up with lots and lots of possibilities, whereas introverted intuition has a more narrow focus but deeper. Um, so it might go really in depth into this, you know, a religious spiritual practice, maybe. And, and really trying to figure out everything it can about that and not really getting distracted by, oh, here's another avenue of that I could explore and another avenue about that I could explore. This doesn't mean that NPs cannot explore anything in depth. They absolutely can, but there's more of a natural tendency to go to explore a multitude of things in a more shallow way versus NJs. It's one thing or two things, but really, really deep. Um, 
extroverted intuition likes to keep its options open, whereas introverted intuition wants to decide. And then again, at the end, it, extrovert intuition is going to generate ideas out loud. And introvert intuition, often that idea generating process is happening inside. It's more of a private internal process. So you may not see it as much with NJs because if you ask them to brainstorm with you or to talk about their idea in all this detail, um, they can kind of lose their focus as they're talking um, because it's so deep, whatever they're, they're, they've ideated or discovered or envisioned. But trying to put words to it almost feels like it's losing its power as they're talking. Whereas for NPs, they feel like they're gaining more momentum as they're talking. Um, and then I'm just going to finish off with these quotes by what I believe are some famous NP types. I could totally be wrong because I have not actually sit, sat down and consulted any of these people. Um, so Steve Wozniak says, everything's changing. Everything's dynamic. You get this idea and you get another idea and this doesn't work out and you have to replace it with something else. So I think this speaks to the extrovert intuitive style of liking things being changing and dynamic and trying one thing. Well, that didn't work. Try another thing. So it's a good example. I think he's a great example of an ENTP um, who has really made a big difference in the world. Walt Disney, he's either an ENTP or an ENFP. People kind of argue about wh which one he is. But he has two quotes. One is, all our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. And by nature, I'm an experimenter. To this day, I don't believe in sequels. I can't follow popular cycles. I have to move on to new things. I think probably Walt Disney would be really annoyed by this constantly remaking the same movies that is happening now. <laughs> because in for him, it, you always had to be trying something new. And that's something, again, that you know extrovert intuitives are going to get really frustrated. They have to, like, if they have to repeat processes, they want to try, they want to move on to new and different, more novel ideas all the time. And um, Robin Williams, I believe, was an ENFP. And he said, imagining something is better than remembering something. And uh, that's a great example of, you know, extrovert intuitives are so uh, excited by imagining things. And while they do have that introverted sensing that, that ties them to memories, they're always looking for tomorrow, like the potential, what could be. And um, he says, the world is your oyster. Never stop trying new things. And there's one last one, um, Anais Nin, who a lot of people say was an ENFP. Um, she says, reality doesn't impress me. I only believe in intoxication, in ecstasy, and when ordinary life shackles me, I escape one way or another. No more walls. And I think this kind of ties into what Carl Jung was saying is when a situation isn't changing for an extrovert and intuitive, it feels like you're chained and you, you've got to escape. And I think her quote speaks to that. When ordinary life shackles me, I escape one way or another. And then she says, in me, there's always movement, renewal, surprises. I have never known stagnation. Stagnation is basically the worst like fear of an extroverted intuitive to not be able to be inspired, to not be able to try new things, to not be able to come up with new ideas. So that's the end of my slide. So now I want to move on to the, I know we have a question here from Christina. She says, what if you prefer to decide and have a plan, but you have trouble reaching a decision? And um, I'm going to hand the mic over to, to Crystal Mm -hmm. and see if you have any thoughts off the top of your head. If you are, I don't know if Christine, if you're an extroverted intuitive type, but what are your thoughts on this, Crystal? Um, I think Chris, uh, Christina, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're referring to like the slide where you're comparing an Ian and I, correct? Um, I think it was that one. If you don't mind going back to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me add it up here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that one. So um, yeah, without more context, I'm not too sure. But what I would say is that I feel like that, like a lot of INFJs I know, not INTJs as much of INFJs I know, um, do struggle with that. Like they will go back and forth between how to actually execute on some plan that they want, um, but not be able to quite commit to one. And I want to like focus on that, like, it's not the problem of committing or not that NE and NI, that differentiates NE and NI. Um, 
I think like a better way to think about it because also like a lot of NI users because our world requires you to be so extroverted. I think a lot of like INJs to like get ahead will be more like imaginative and think about possibilities. But it's not like the same as that being like your default mode. Like I think that like for me what I've noticed with like NE DOMs versus like NI DOMs is I kind of like pay attention to like the genesis of where their ideas are coming from. Like for me, I it, it's like automatic. I just like have the ideas like float to me like, ooh, I could do this. I could do this. I could do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't necessarily have trouble like deciding on one. I just have trouble sticking with one once I've decided. Uh, like I'll just kind of be like, all right, we're just going to try that one. Like, and I'll be like, eh, this, this sounds like a kind of a bad idea. Like it feels like more natural to kind of flow between the ideas. But I won't necessarily spend forever trying to decide like from the get go. Like the entry fee to deciding isn't that much. The entry fee to sticking with it is like the laws of physics in the ideas sense almost is like defiant of my buoyancy versus with NI, I think a lot of NI users want to know, they want to deeply understand the nature of the situation or problem that they're dealing with and make a decision that they can stick with. Like it's like their desire, like their natural state is to be decided. But often if you have trouble reaching a decision as an NI DOM, it's because you don't have enough external input from like the SE world. Like for example, my friend always has trouble figuring out which party to go to on a Saturday night. And even if he wasn't already obviously introverted, his whole decision-making process comes down to, he doesn't have an idea of the environments or the conditions of each of these parties. So without like the appropriate amount of information, he won't, he'll be paralyzed with indecision. Um, and for me, I'll be like, all right, I don't need that many details. I'll just kind of roll the punches and just kind of like create a plan from scratch. And then I'll just be flexible when it falls through. Yeah, whatever. Um, so we work very differently in that sense. And I guess I feel like every INJ desires to be open-minded, but struggles with it. Um, and their happy default is when they don't need that many possibilities. For me, it's like I am seizing the possibilities, not just generating them, but wanting to exist inside them. I found that NI users can generate the possibilities, but they aren't literally trying to have all their cakes needed to. Hope that helps. I think that is helpful. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think that you're right about if you can, if you're struggling struggling to decide, it could be that you're you need information from your extroverted functions, like, and and um, that same decision making um, process that I talked about before, where you start with sensing, then intuition, then thinking and feeling, that can also apply to making decisions because a lot of times we make decisions from our dominant or our secondary process. So if you're a thinker. You, it's easy to just jump into a decision because you've got the thinking data that you like. Like, okay, this makes sense financially. So the metrics all add up. So I'll just do that. Um, and when you just make a decision from one space, then you could be missing information from another space. Like maybe that that thinking decision is missing information. Maybe you're missing information from feeling that could help you, you know, make a better decision. Mm -hmm. So if you're ever stuck on a decision, what you can do is just get a piece of paper out and write sensing, intuition, thinking, feeling, and be like, yeah. all right, let me look at the sensing. Am I missing sensing information? Which is what Crystal was talking about, which is like, what party do I want to go to is a great example. Like maybe I can't decide because I don't have enough information. Maybe I don't have enough in extroverted sensing facts to go on. Like if I, I don't, if it's a small party, maybe I'd like that. But if, if I don't know if there's going to be 50 or hundred people there, then maybe I would really hate that. So there's a lot of, maybe there's information that's missing. If you are missing, you know, thinking information on a decision, maybe you just don't have an idea what the, the what's logical or what the pros and cons are or what, you know, what, you know, the math is in a situation. Like, I don't know if I want to make this business decision because I haven't looked at the metrics enough to decide whether it's a profitable decision for me. So, yeah. you know, anytime you feel stumped on a decision, it's usually because you're missing information from one of those four categories, sensing, intuition, yeah, thinking, so. or feeling. Like, I feel like this is, like, I totally resonate with that. I wanted to add that, like, I think with the dichotomies, like EPs, all EPs are going to have more, like, like, even if I'm in a bad mood, it won't take me much convincing to, like, go and do something. And I will still at even 40%, like, operating power come off, like, a lot of people's, like, 70%. 
Like it doesn't take much effort for me to go out and seek and explore and get the information to make the decision. So what I want to emphasize is I think like the difference with like an NE DOM versus like an NI DOM, I don't think NE is indecisive. I think NE is just non-committal. And NI, on the other hand, I think um, is not non-committal, but could be indecisive. Like, I don't think it's the lack of decision making that tells you whether you're any or NI. Because sure, like the ideal of like the NJ is they're always very like, woo, like, you know, they, they're very strong and like, they're like just doing things and just shooting from the hip and, you know, but that's when I think NI and SE are both like balanced well. If you're just an NI land as an NJ, then I don't think you're going to feel that sense of decisiveness, this like signature sort of gusto, right? And so that's something I want to emphasize about NE versus NI. Like, I would not consider myself or most of my NP friends indecisive. We just have trouble sticking with things. But I, I won't put much weight on making the wrong decision because I'll just be like, I'll just do something else or improvise, whatever. Um, that being said, when I'm insecure, I will feel bad and not want to act. But even then, I wouldn't say I feel indecisive. Like, if I'm like... I don't want to tell this guy how I feel. Oh no, that's not the same as being indecisive. That's more like I've decided that I don't want to, but I'm trying to get myself to not, uh, not not want to. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a. It's good to expand on that because yeah, I I have a you know, it's easy for an NJ to look at an NPs and go, oh, they're indecisive, but it's not that they're they are indecisive. They're making lots and lots and lots of little decisions. <laughs> we just like, really are. What, what's the what's the actual path they're gonna stick to and this is also something you'll find with sp types it's just a perceiver thing mm -hmm. you know um yes i love when it was like when i look at you i'm like that's indecision because if i was doing that i'd be indecisive mm -hmm. like, right right <laughs> yeah because like when it you know like for me for example it, when i decided on a career path it's like okay i've had i've spent a long time creating a strategy and then i'm going to follow the path because I'm a chart the course type in Linda Barron's system, all you know, mm -hmm. and so I, I'm following the course that I made. So it's going to be a very long term process where mm -hmm. you know I'm married to an EP, and um, the decision is more like one week. It's I really like this idea. I think I'll do that with my life. And the next week, I really like that idea. I think I'll do that with my life. And it can it, you know they're making lots of decisions. It's just that they're experimenting with lots of them rather than just sticking to one and long term staying on that one path. Um, because I only have about 10 more minutes, I just want to open the conversation up. I know that's not a lot of time, but I want to open the conversation up to anyone else who has any questions. I know we've answered them kind of as we're going, but if you haven't had a chance to ask a question yet and you have one you'd like to ask, feel free to go ahead and comment with that question right now. And if we don't get a chance to get to them all, I will always get onto YouTube or Facebook later and I can try to answer them in the comments as well. Yeah, I will. yeah but we'd love to hear. Yeah. So, um, I know, um, Christina, she said that, you know, your explanation, Crystal, made her feel a little bit more confident about preferring NI. Now, if, if you're watching this and you're like, what in the world is NI? And I know, I, I know I, I'm always like reintroducing what the codes mean, but I always feel bad because I know sometimes, you know, when I was first learning about type, I don't remember how many, it was like 15 years ago or something. I remember running into these articles and things where people were talking about cognitive functions. And I was like, what are they talking about? What's NI? What's this? What's TI? And so, um, yeah, if you're not sure what NI is, it's introverted intuition. I know it's right up there on the screen. But a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know if I'm NJ or NP. And I think that whole decision making process that the you said, Crystal, you kind of living in the possibilities. And I think, you know, for NJs, they are definitely thinking through lots of possibilities with their introvert intuition. But it's not that they're like wanting to, like you said, have their cake and eat it too. And all the different ones, they're trying to figure out the one. And um, Katya says, maybe it's specific, but how does an ESTJ use her extroverted intuition tertiary function? And, um, I'll, I'll ask Crystal her thoughts, but what I've seen, because I've done a lot of work with ESTJs, is that um, they're pretty good. Like, when, they, well, what, for one thing, when they're in their downtime, that's when I see their extrovert intuition show up more. Because the tertiary function, another another label for the tertiary function is the child function, if you um, study any of John Beebe's work on type. And so the tertiary function can be a place where people like to play and get creative. So I've found that ESTJs in their downtime can have like play with humor, 
play with storytelling. They like, you know, maybe watching, you know, fantasy or science fiction movies where things are kind of unusual and different. Um, and also in a work context, I've seen when I've worked with ESTJs, this ability sometimes to, uh, you know, pull this possibility out of a hat that nobody was expecting in a tough situation. And um, they're actually much better at brainstorming than people give them credit for. I've known a lot of ESTJs who typed themselves as ENTJ because they think of brainstorming as an intuitive process, but it's really that they're tapping into their tertiary NE. And so they can be really good at brainstorming possibilities and solutions at work and things like that. What are your thoughts, Crystal? Yeah, I feel like ESTJ, so like, I've had a lot of ESTJ friends that, yeah, they think they're ENTJs, but I like always look for like, how do you use NISE versus like SI, NE? And I think that like, ESTJs can be like playful and almost come off like a little bit of an ENFP because I think like when me and like my ESTJ friend are both in social situations, we'll both be like kind of riffing and like cute and like the life of the party in this like certain like bubbly way. But I think that the way that ESTJ approaches situations is I think like a little less like whatever it takes, we're going to do it. Yeah. Like I think that's like the ENTJ and how they use their NINSE. Like I can, I like kind of like cross parallel, like, an ENTJ using like SE to like they're gonna like brute force their way through life you very much feel the force of their drive um and so that's like how the SE manifests but I think the ESTJ will be more light hearted about like brainstorming and about like knowing that like okay in order to get this thing I want I have to be like open-minded so let me like figure out a way to like go by this plan and then like foresee like potential obstacles and how we'll tackle them. So it's kind of like they always use it in conjunction with their SI to like balance it. I find that like the, like, I don't know, the stereotype, which I think is a little unfair sometimes of like the rigid SJ isn't often actually an ESJ. It's often like an ISJ. I think ESJs can like not give away that they're S types sometimes because how they like to interface with people and how they've learned like, it's socially acceptable to be is to be a little more playful and a little more introspective and intuitive. So you might find yourself able to have conversations with ESTJs because they really care about like certain ideas, but they'll always like kind of look at like the root of like, I don't know, like historically how something has gone. So they'll really care about the genesis and the origin of like, when did this first like happen, like when did this event happen? How do we get here today? So they care a lot more about the past still, but they'll use it to like brainstorm about like what this means about where we are in the future. So I think this is what people mistake for NI sometimes if someone's like trying to like forecast or look ahead. But I think like an ESTJ, like I think a lot of ESTJs, sure they can be CEOs, but I find they make really good CFOs because they're just really practical and not impulsive with like money or all these things, but they're still using NE to like generate the ideas of how this money can or can't be used and all this stuff. So you'll always see the NE being linked to the SI um, where there's just like this implicit sense of practicality about things. It might take you a while to type like the ESG using NE. This is why people mistake them. But I do think that on a physical level, they'll be just less of a intense presence at times than like an ENTJ. And I think they'll be a little more playful. Like if you challenge their idea, they're not gonna be maybe as dismissive in my experience because NE makes you open-minded to hearing what the external world's feedback loop is. Thank you, Crystal. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. I actually know like two ENT or two ESTJs who insist that they're ENTJs. Um, Okay, well, maybe, you know, I, I always think it's a little cocky to say that you know their type and they don't. But um, their SI, their introverted sensing and their extroverted intuition is so evident in everything. And um, they are, they're really good at, ESTJs are really good at brainstorming because introverted sensing and extroverted intuition are in the middle of their function stack. They really can flip flop between them pretty easily. And they have a pretty good relationship with them. And because they're extroverted, they usually have a good relationship with their extroverted thinking and their extroverted intuition. Like they like kind of going back and forth between TE and NE, you know? And so, um, you know, as an example, my, you know, this person I know who thinks they're an ENTJ, but they're an ESTJ, I think. They, they love just like ideating with people and they can just go on and on, like brainstorming with people. 
Um, but ultimately, they're going to be like, well, what, you know, what actually worked in the past? What can I replicate from my, the past and, and, you know, kind of work with that? And then anytime you want to watch a movie or listen to a song with them, it's always songs they listened to when they were like a teenager and always movies they liked when they were young. It's never a new song or a new movie. It's let's listen to this song that I liked when I was Old 19. Favorite. Yes. Yes. Or or even, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I was going somewhere with it and I forgot it. But um, there's this huge desire to replay experiences from the past, which is a very introverted sensing thing to do. Oh, absolutely. But, but they're, you know, so that's another, you know, giveaway that someone's more of an STJ versus NTJ. I know that wasn't the question, but it comes up a lot where a lot of times people yeah. think, well, I can't be an ESTJ because in the type community, there's a lot of stereotypes about SJs. Like they're boring or predictable or, you know, they're yeah. really boring stereotypes and they're really not boring people. I would say they're not boring. Yeah. I know you have to like, going into sex news and I just wanted to address Steven's um, addition about like, how with brainstorming with ESTJ, you have to connect with something you've seen in the past because they struggle with new concepts. I think this is pretty true for sure. Like, I my friend says that she thinks of NE as like curating and NI as like actually trying to create a completely new concept with no examples. I think if you look at like SJs, they'll connect all their ideas to an example they've seen. They'll get the idea from the example. They won't just be like, what is this for true? And then like find what fits. So yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a great that that's I've also seen that too. Um, and then I um, also want to say hi, Acacia. Um, and she says or he I don't know for sure. Um, our ENFJ is usually pretty good at extrovert intuition or what tends to be the relationship with it. And that's that's a big question. And I've got to get off in a couple of minutes, but I want to kind of touch on it really briefly anyway. Um, and I'll try to respond in the comments also. Um, so for what I've seen or what what. ENFJs, we all use all the functions, right? For ENFJs, extroverted intuition would be in the sixth spot, which technically is called the critical parent role, um, if you follow John Beebe's eight function model. So sometimes, um, oh my goodness, that would be such a big, big topic to go into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, why don't you, why did, I'm like, I don't know if I want to go into BB's eight function model now, because that's like an hour long conversation, yeah. not a few minutes. You have a best friend who's ENFJ, I think. So why don't you try that one? Yeah, I can just like take it from like the uh, behavioral level as opposed to talking about models, but feel free to definitely look up the function stack. Um, I would say ENFJs, they can like, it's not, to me, it's not true NE, like what ENJs can do, but they are good at generating possibilities. They are good at riffing along, especially if an NP is in the room. They can look like an NP as well because they are bouncing off that energy. Um, and their relationship is very receptive and open because by default, NI doesn't like have all these ideas floating in usually. But if an idea comes to them from like another person, they'll be like, oh, yeah, let me like go off that. So an ENJ can seem very bouncy and a little scattered like an NE user. I've heard this a lot before, but I think at the same time, they're not going to be, like I said earlier, they're not going to be in like non-committal seeming. They might be more indecisive. Like they might have a possibility that they want to do something with. A lot of ENFJs like using NE to catalyze a slapstick comedy routine that they go really deep into like one idea that they like found like from like thinking about possibilities. I think ENFJs aren't literally just brainstorming ideas for fun. Like, oh, let's go here or here or here or here. They're not going to do that. They'll be more like, like talking about like social dynamics. Like, I just think that NE is very example heavy with how it is. And ENFJs aren't using examples when they seem bouncy or when they are talking about multiple ideas. Um, but yeah, that's like my super concise version. I'm happy to talk about this more. If you want to leave a comment on the video, I can definitely follow up there. So yeah. Yeah, I think that would be wonderful because I, I know that you have a lot of experience with ENFJs. So I think that your your dialogue on that's really important. And also, Acacia, um, I will try to post, I've got, written an article about the ENFJs eight function stack. And not everyone buys into the eight function model, but it's something that I really like because you know, I, I think that John Beebe as a psychologist, he worked with a lot of people and really saw how we all use the eight functions and in these different ways. And so I have an article I've written about ENFJs that goes into how they use each of the eight functions. And I can put a link in the comments um, so that you can see that too. And that might be a little more, yeah. a little bit more, you know, 
um, yeah, feel if free you're to, looking for that. Feel free to post your question. And I'll definitely like go back to this video and comment on it as well because I don't have more to say about it. Um, uh, but yeah, like we can definitely think more. So yeah. I think we could do a three part with Crystal probably and, and, and like on extrovert intuition because you do have a lot of great insights on it. And so I really want to say thank you so much for joining me, Crystal, today and, and everyone who tuned in too, because you guys asked some really, really good questions and um, really made us think. And Crystal, you had some wonderful responses and hearing from you and your lived experience as an ENP was really helpful. So I want to say thank you to Crystal for doing that. Crystal, is there any way, like if anyone's like, oh, I want to see more about what Crystal does, um, do you have a website or anything like that where people yeah. can find out more about what you do? You'll yeah, definitely like link it in the description. I can like send you all that. But yeah, people yeah. can email me. Um, I'm on Instagram at Crystal X Duan. I'm also on Twitter. That's a bit of a shit posting, but same user. <laughs> And if you search my name on YouTube, you'll find some videos I've made before about type. I'm actually going to get back into making those um, in September. So yeah, look, feel free to look. Yeah, absolutely. She's done a lot of videos with Megan Lavoda. And um, I just heard a kid <laughs> screaming in the background. So that's my cue that I better go. But thanks so much for everyone for tuning in. And I will respond to comments later. So don't fret if you couldn't get your question in right now. Thanks so much, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.